This is Textland, episode 123, recorded live May 27th, 2016. The Shack is back. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Tech Slant. I'm Donovan Adkiss and I'm joined by my co-host and good friend Samuel Lewis. Hey, Sam. How's, uh, how's your Friday been? It's been going great. I had, had one of those Fridays where I get some stuff done, go one step further in the employment line, stuff like that. So things are looking good and I even got insurance. So it's it's one of those days. You're not physically standing in an employment line, right? No. <laughs> okay. All right. I am holding the laptop as I stand here going, yeah, I'm doing a podcast. Yeah, I'm, I'm wheeling all my equipment <laughs> on a little cart. <laughs> Did you say insurance? You actually got yeah. insurance? Yeah, through the Kentucky Connect thing. So, oh. th- thank you. Thank you, Kentucky government. <laughs> so, they're one of the states that actually decided to uh, expand their Medi- Medicare. Yep. Oh. <laughs> which, which threw me off because I didn't know that's what it was called. I went, Medicare? Isn't that <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what it used to mean, right? So Right, right. So yeah, because because the 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 state of Tennessee decided to be mean to me, I'm not even getting that anymore. So it's <laughs> mm. <laughs> Yeah. So I definitely qualified for that. <laughs> so. Yeah, see the state of Georgia and, and I've talked about this before, and of course that's not what this show is about, but mm. uh our governor decided not to expand Medicare. So we actually fell up in that big ass hole where I can't get insurance unless I want to pay $800 a month, and I don't even get any kind of tax credits from the federal government because I fall below the threshold that is supposed to put me at the state level, but yet my state doesn't support it. Hmm. So, anyway, that is not what we're here to talk about this evening. That's a Watts discussion. That is a Watts discussion, yes. (laughs) All right, so let's start off uh, this this episode, and I'll let you uh, take the lead. What are we going to talk about? Okay, away we go. Um, released May the 16th, Doom is ID Software's latest first-person shooter. Wait, that's that's already been a first-person shooter. Well, let me let me explain. Let me explain. Um, and is considered a reboot of the classic franchise that helped revolutionize and popularize the genre back in the 90s. And that was in the 90s. I'd, I had no idea. Um, I grew up in the 90s, and I had no idea Doom existed until later on. Yep. Um, the game sports eye-catching environments and wonderfully designed maps. The game gets you into the action rather quickly as you're immediately firing away at demons when you start a level. This game is all about the action with very little getting in the way of that focus. Something that actually comes as a breath of fresh air for the genre. Windows 10 has been with us for a little over eight months now, which means there are only about four months remaining to get a free upgrade from an older Windows operating system. And as the clock counts down, Microsoft has begun to auto-schedule PCs (laughs) to upgrade to Windows 10 with or without consent from end users. Now, as the uh, as we are near the end of the free upgrade period, Microsoft's malware-like upgrade system is becoming even more intrusive by auto-scheduling upgrades to Windows 10. Instead of a reminder to upgrade to Windows 10, it will now inform you that it has already scheduled an upgrade uh, or an update to upgrade to Windows 10 for you. How nice of it. (laughs) There are options to cancel the scheduled upgrade or to change the upgrade date so the system isn't exactly forcing you to upgrade if you can catch it soon enough. The problem, of course, is that some users are not going to see this in time to stop it. So they're going to wake up one morning and they're going to go to use their PC and they're going to find that it's stuck trying to upgrade to Windows 10 or it's using up a lot of bandwidth trying to download the Windows 10 ISO which Mm. is almost four gigs. Right. So if you wish to stay with your older operating system, you should check your Windows 10 update pop-up daily to ensure that it does not force you to upgrade without your knowledge 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) Poor, poor Justin Robert Young got hit by this, his, his podcasting rig. So his whole streaming rig and everything got hit with this and, oh, mm, took a while for him to recover from that one. It was like a week, maybe a couple of days. The point is that he, he fixed everything, but it, it just snuck up out of nowhere on him where he suddenly realized there was windows 10 there. Now there is. There is this, the thing that they suggest, but also Steve Gibson has jumped into the fray because you know what Steve Gibson does. Oh, yeah. Uh, So he has created a piece of software that you can get over at GRC that will actually nip this in the butt. So it sort of does that registry hack that there was way back in whenever this was first starting Mm -hmm. and pretty much does it for you. Yeah, there's a there's actually a tool that uh, Tyler and I use to try to put it on machines that we don't want to upgrade called GWX Control Panel. I think mm. it's GWX. Anyway, it's uh, and you can go in and actually tell it, don't do the pop up, don't download any Windows 10 stuff. If there's actually already Windows 10 stuff on here, delete it, um, and it works really really well. So I I would encourage uh, if anyone is I don't. You know, if you're on Windows 7 or you're on Windows 8 and you just don't want to take the plunge to Windows 10, keep in mind that, A, if you don't go ahead and do it now, it's going to be $130 after July 31st. Um, and, B, you can go ahead and upgrade now, activate it, and then if you don't like it, you can roll back to your previous operating system. Mm. And then if you do decide that you want to upgrade after July 31st, it's still free because it's yep. already activated. Yeah, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> Reddit's image uploading feature began rolling out this week with 50 Reddit communities, including art, awe, food, funny, gifts, and earth porn. Really pretty nature pics, guys. <laughs> that's, that's what that is. <laughs> um, an eventual site-wide release is Reddit's plan. The feature should make Reddit simpler and faster to and faster to use, and easier for newbies to figure out, myself included. Uh, Reddit will accept images up to 20 megabytes and GIFs up to 100 megabytes compared to the 20 megabyte image and 200 megabyte GIF images on Imgur. It will apply its standard content policy, disallowing images that are illegal, involuntary pornography, like revenge porn or hacks, obviously, um, encourage or incite violence, are threats to, are threats or harassment, expose confidential personal information, impersonate people, or are spam. Reddit images could soak up page views that lead to more browsing on the site, which it monetizes with native ads. Meanwhile, Imgur could miss out on page views and ad revenue. Reddit is the ninth largest site by traffic in the U.S., according to Alexa, while Imgur is the 16th. The only The only thing <clears throat> that I had a problem with in that article is you mispronounced GIF. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for you to get there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the man himself that created it said, damn it, it's GIF. And he took too dang long, the people decided. So, <laughs> <sighs> Oh, well. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so, if you're looking to flex your creative muscles and possibly trying out some game creation, you're going to have to look somewhere other than Microsoft, at least if you're in that gray area between have no idea what you're doing and planning to develop and sell games for real. The company has officially canceled its Project Spark half game, half platform, which allowed buyers to create their own little games within one big sandbox. I actually played around with this. It it was uh it was interesting. Mm. Microsoft is officially pulling the plug on Project Spark on August the 12th and after that date, the company notes that the game's online services will no longer be available and as a result, those who already own Project Spark will be unable to both upload their own content and download anyone else's. You'll still be able to play anything you've already downloaded offline. But you should, if you should ever delete it, or if your Xbox or PC just rolls over and dies, you won't have any way to reacquire the mini games. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. Yep. This this might have been a nice way to dabble and stuff, but I guess they can't keep everything alive all the time. It had right? a very interesting way of of allowing you to create games, and what they did is certain models cost 
uh, you know, certain amount of dollars or, or whatever. I, I think they got away from that whole credit thing they used to do, like Microsoft points or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, I dabbled with it a little bit. You could put a creature here and you could kind of set how you wanted them to walk, where they want to walk. You could create like events, like when they got over here, if they punched something, then something else happened. It was, uh, it, it was very um, forward thinking for someone who didn't know anything about programming a game, but maybe actually had some game ideas. Um, and, I, and I thought that, you know, they had something, but apparently, as with a lot of things that Microsoft has gotten themselves into over the last few years, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know, buying an entire cell phone company and then shuttering the, <laughs> the entire thing, uh, they, <laughs> yeah. just, they just have trouble trying to figure out what it is that they want to do. So, yeah, they do. They're anyway. The, the age of Nadella is the age of experimentation. <laughs> yeah. Um, I highly apologize for what I'm about to do, but I can't help myself. Windows 7 now has a service pack, ha has a service pack too. Don't call it a service pack! <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyone who's installed Windows 7 anytime in the last oh, five years or so probably didn't enjoy the experience very much. Service Pack 1 for the operating system was released in 2011, meaning that a fresh install has five years of individual patches to download and install. Ugh. <laughs> Typically, this means multiple trips to Windows Update and multiple reboots in order to get the system fully up to date. And it's a process that is at best tedious, typically leading to one to wonder why, at the very least, it cannot pull down all the updates at once and apply them with a single reboot. Microsoft did... Microsoft has announced a change that will greatly reduce the pain of this process. Um... <clears throat> the company has published a convenience roll-up for Windows 7 Sur Service Pack 1 and Windows Server 2008 R2, which is a single pack, which in a single package contains all the updates, both security and non-security, released since the service pack, up through April 2016. Installing the roll-up will perform five years of patching in one shot, in other words, it performs a very similar role that Windows 7 Service Pack 2 would have done if only Windows 7 Service Pack 2 were to exist. It's not quite the same as a Service Pack. It still requires Service Pack 1 to be installed, and the system will still report that it's running Service Pack 1, but for most intents and purposes, that won't matter. Microsoft will also support injecting this rollup into Windows 7 Service Pack 1 system images and install media. Yeah. I can tell you, having been someone who has had to uh, do multiple installs of Windows 7 on various PCs over the <laughs> last year, uh, the uh, the update process is painful. I mean, when you have a machine that can sit here for seven to eight hours just going through and downloading all of the updates for a Windows 7 machine, it, it is, it's excruciating, it is. to say the least. So, yeah, I this thing had Windows 7 on it before I upgraded to Windows 10 and I've had to reboot it before and it was it was not fun, not fun at all. Yeah, this this is something that's been a long time coming and it needed to come uh and they honestly need to call it Service Pack 2. But at least it is a roll up. Um the only caveat is there's a particular update that you got to make sure that's installed first and um so what we did is we went ahead and pulled all that stuff down and put it on our storage server so that in the event we need it for a client's PC or any of ours, that we've got it. Yeah. All right. So victims of the te Tesla Crypt ransomware have a new hope. I hope so, because I didn't even know what it was. Never heard <laughs> of it. I know what type it is, but I'd never heard of this one particularly. The developers of the nefarious malware strain have apparently shut down operations and released a master key that will unlock all encrypted files on computers infected by the latest versions of TeslaCrypt. So using the master, cre uh, the master key, ESET has created a decryptor tool that is available for download with detailed instructions from the ESET website. Another TeslaCrypt decoder with an easier-to-use interface has been posted on the Bleeping Computer website. TeslaCrypt first appeared in early 2015, and initially targeted players of PC games locking up game files 
and demanding <laughs> $500 in Bitcoin to release the decryption keys. It later uh. became more generalized, attacking all sorts of PC users. Infection generally came via corrupted websites, malvertising, or email attachments. This isn't the first time a ransomware developer or distributor has had a change of heart, though. In June of last year, the apparent creator of the Locker ransomware suddenly unlocked all the computers that had been infected, possibly because he'd made enough money over the eight days that Locker <laughs> was active. I'm sorry about the encryption. Your files are unlocked for free, he wrote in a note. Be good to the world. And don't forget to smile. Wow. <laughs> Can you imagine just especially the original thing that this did? You're really wanting to play Overwatch, right? Yeah. Guess what? Five hundred dollar in Bitcoin. <laughs> wow. Mm mm mm. Just be horrible. Yeah. Okay, which one of us is doing this one? Because it's double booked here. Oh, that's you. Okay. <clears throat> Some have criticized Google for falling behind when it comes to social networking and new communication services, but the company is now working hard to catch up. Google announced a new video calling app called Duo, a high-definition app for Android and iOS devices. Duo was unveiled on the heels of Elo, Google's new smart messaging app. Them and their names, I just... Uh, while Elo... It's me, uh, is focused on interacting with Google's assistant bot and potentially many friends and maybe uh, and potentially many friends and maybe more comparable to something like Messenger, for instance. Uh, Duo's comparison is something more like Apple's FaceTime. You use it for one-on-one -on -one conversations. The other thing that Duo is touting is the engineering is the engineering that has gone into making the video in the app work. Google says it will work the same whether your network is super fast or patchy. This in itself, if it really bears out, would be amazing for anyone who has cursed his or her way through a bad hangout or Skype call. Currently, du like right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, Duo was built by the same team that created WebRTC, and it uses WebRTC. It was built with using a new programming protocol, Quick, which Google unveiled last year as a route to speeding up data-heavy applications that travel over the web. Yeah, I was uh, I was reading a little bit into this and some of the comments on the article, and of course, you know, the question came up: Well, why are they doing this? Because you already have video and Hangouts, mm -hmm. so why are they creating something else? This duo that you can do, you know, one-on-one -on -one video. And I'm thinking, well, have you ever actually tried the video in Hangouts? It, it's <laughs> crap most of the time. I mean, granted, I, I, I get it. People like Tom Merritt use the hell out of it. Yeah. I can't stand it. I can barely stand Skype. Uh, you know, you and I have had some really good Skype sessions this week doing doing the watch show. But yeah. for whatever reason tonight, your your video coming to me is, is good quality. It's at about three frames a second. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't know what that is. I don't Nothing's either. Nothing's changed. <laughs> I know. It's absolutely, it's nutso. So anything that a company such as Google can do to create a better experience of video conversations, I'm all for it. I don't care if they already have four other programs out there that might do something with video. Yeah. You know, if you can give me something that works as well as FaceTime does on, on iOS devices, mm -hmm. and I've used FaceTime, and it works really, really well. Of it course, does. It's like any anything Apple. It works really, really well until it doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> so, but the point is, I'm, I'm okay with that. Now, their Allo thing, basically, it's like they're trying to make a, a Facebook Messenger competitor. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, but Google... You've already tried competing with Facebook. It's this thing you got called Google Plus. <laughs> you failed. You failed miserably. It's an interesting community. It'll never match up to Facebook. I'm sorry. So I don't even know why you want to try something like Allo. But mm. anyway. All right. So E3 is coming up. E3 2016 is going to host an event open to the general public, the first in the Expo's history. E3 Live 2016, according to its website, will be free. It'll be a three-day expo of its own, held June 14th through the 16th. It won't take place at the Los Angeles Convention Center, where the standard E3 convention is held. Instead, 
The ticketed showcase will be at LA Live in downtown Los, An- Los Angeles. The event kicks off at 5 p.m. Pacific time on June the 14th with gameplay demos, live music and dance contests, special appearances, and more. This isn't the only free event uh, running during E3. Electronic Arts is holding a separate event, EA Play, from June 12th to the 14th. It's open to all and will take place of the company's take the place of the company's usual E3 press conference. Activision is similarly passing on its E3 presence this year. Instead, it will showcase games at other publishers' booths. Although there will be events starting the Sunday before E3 2016, run by the Entertainment Software Association, officially runs June 14th through the 16th. Mm. Uh, so is this an indication of some of these big names jumping ship from E3? Well, <laughs> There, there are several things we have to remember about E3. It's, it's always been so flashy in the past that we sometimes forget it's a trade show, right? Mm-hmm. These are the people coming to, we want your game in our store and stuff like that. And that's what E3 is, right? Uh, so that's still apparently going strong. But the more public-facing presence of the press conferences and stuff like that, um, and I, I really do want to give Nintendo credit for this because they were the first ones to get out of the race, as it were. Um, they started doing their Nintendo Directs during E3 instead of doing a press conference there because they've been doing Nintendo Directs for quite a while at this point, where instead of doing a press conference or anything like that, they just do a live stream show from Nintendo that's it's like a press conference. It really is, except anyone can watch it streaming online, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And the success of the Nintendo Directs has sort of, I think, made all these other companies look and go, do we really need to do these press conferences when even Nintendo's getting this success from this, right? Um, so, yeah, it's one of those things where I think they're starting to realize that that's starting to not be as a big of things. And they may focus more on the business side from now on with E3 and do these more public events where anyone can go in anyway instead of having to have a press badge and everything. So they, they're, they're doing a different tilt, a different pivot, if you will, it mm-hmm. seems like. And it is also smart of them to hold it in a separate place instead of the same convention center. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think this is a good move on their part. Well, good deal. I've never been to an E3. I got a friend of mine who uh, has been to an E3 event before, but I've never been to one. Mm. And I probably won't be going to one anytime soon. It'd be fascinating to go, but not a priority. Yeah, definitely not a priority. Mm. Um, Google has prevailed in its legal battle with Oracle over its use of Java APIs to build its Android mobile operating system. Oracle took the internet giant to court, claiming that Google owed it billions for using the 37 API packages without paying copyright licensing fees. However, Google successfully convinced a jury in federal court that its use of of the API amounted to, quote, fair use. Oracle says it isn't over, however. While Google and others have argued that APIs shouldn't be the subject of copyright protection, a U.S. Court of Appeals in 2014 ruled that copyright law did indeed apply to the Java APIs. Those siding with Google warned the ruling could have a chilling effect on developers. But Google's successful use of the fair use argument should mitigate that impact. Oracle, meanwhile, argued that Google caused substantial market harm by using the APIs freely, since it influenced other licensing agreements. The Oracle team also pointed to emails that suggested that Android developers knew they were obligated to pay a licensing fee for the APIs. <laughs> I d- I'm, I'm not so sure about this one. This is, this is one of those that I'm kind of eh about, right? Especially considering the amount of things that people have used the Java just framework in general for, right? Um, well, well, my thing is, if I'm not mistaken, and I very well could be because I know Tyler and I talked about this, Java was supposed to be open source, open source cross-platform. I was That was my understanding. Now, if I'm wrong, I apologize. But that means that those APIs were, were open and available. You know, Java was originally a product of Sun, and I'm pretty confident, and like I said, I'll, you know, caveat here, I could be wrong, 
Because I'm right. just thinking about this right now. But back whenever it was part of Sun, it was it wasn't anything that you had to purchase. It wasn't anything that you all the APIs were available. You could just use them. And of course, then Sun was purchased by Oracle, and I don't know if you know what changed there, if anything. Um, you know, Oracle's trying to claim that Google made it so many millions of dollars on Android by using APIs that they quote unquote own. Right. But I don't know. I mean, I really can't. I really can't say one way or the other. Number, you know, number one, right off the top of my head. I think the fair use argument is legit because I'm thinking that it, these APIs were at least at one time open source. If that's not true, then the fair use argument may not hold. Um, but I can also see the other side where, and it's not like Oracle's hurting for money, okay? They're mm. not. But you always kind of, I don't know, always kind of like, you know, tense up a little bit when a huge company like Google wins something like this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, are they are they actually in the right? And if they aren't, now we're setting a bad precedent. Mm. You know? Yeah. It, it, it's it's kind of like this whole H three H three productions lawsuit thing that's blown yeah. up this week. Yeah, that 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 chestnut. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, these guys just Somebody just needs to, they need to shake hands and walk away and just leave it alone because they're spending more money trying to basically, you know, saber rattle yeah. than anything else. It, it makes absolutely no sense. I mean, Oracle's going to, this is the way I view it. If they could go and actually do, um, um, they could continue this. All right, there's already a ruling. So if they appeal, Let's say they go to an appeal court mm. and they spend X amount of millions of dollars. They finally win. By the time it's all said and done, I'm no economist. I'm no financial expert, but I would argue that Oracle has spent more money trying to basically measure their own size and show it to the world than they actually would get out of it if they were to win the judgment against Google. Yeah. I mean, that's... That's my argument anyway. Mm -hmm. So anyway, otherwise I don't have a dog in this hunt and I don't really care as long as my damn phone continues to work. <laughs> right. And I get the latest and greatest updates on, on my droid. So mm -hmm. we're all right. Okay. A little nugget that I came across this week and I didn't really know that this was even in existence, but the shack is back. Yes. <laughs> So, back in February 2015, Radio Shack filed for bankruptcy, and this this actually had a kind of a a special place in my heart because from 1991, 1990, 91 to 1997, I worked for a company which was a franchise uh, owner, a dealer for Radio Shack in the small oh. town of Fitzgerald, Georgia. Nice. Uh, the corporate entity was Colony Telephone. So anytime I've ever said Colony Telephone, it was Colony Telephone, a Radio Shack dealer. So one part of the business was Radio Shack, and the other part of the business was what I mainly worked in, which was you know the the telephone installations and the cellular phone installations and the building of computer networks and stuff like that. But I got I, I had the benefit of being able to go to the Radio Shack conventions. I think I went to three of them. Nice. And what those were is every, I think it was August, you would go to the convention and you would sit down as a Radio Shack dealer and you would place your Christmas order. You had X amount of dollars based on the size of your store, your, your previous performance and things like that. And let's say, you know, you were extended a line of credit of $150,000 for the sake of argument. All right. You would you would get a catalog that was going to show what was going to be available for sale for, for Christmas. And you would go there and we, they had like rows and rows of computers. So you would go there and I mean, dealers would sit there for hours and hours trying to make informed decisions on, do I need to buy, you know, 
10 of these remote control cars or do I only need to get five of these? You know, what's the hottest new toy that's going to be out and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I was, I, I was privy to that. I went to three of them. Uh, one of them was really fantastic because it was down in Florida. The other two were, eh, they were so-so. <laughs> so it was, it was very interesting to be part of that culture and all. So like I said, this kind of had a special place in my heart whenever I found out that, you know, it was announced last year that they barely had enough money to operate another six to 12 months, and then they filed for bankruptcy. It was like an, an, the end of an era for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it, Radio Shack's a really special name around here, too, because we did we've we've done music all of our lives around here or some form of audio in my case uh so like whenever i got into podcasting the audio wasn't the thing i had to get over let's put it that way um so the one place that you would run to especially in the tiny little town of williamsburg kentucky where at the time we could not use the internet we could not order this stuff like you can now with a snap of your fingers radio shack was the place there were, there were a couple of catalogs like Musician's Friend and stuff like that that you could get some stuff, sure. But that required you to wait. And when that one chord in your entire setup suddenly went, and you, and you desperately needed it for a gig or something, you could go to Radio Shack and you could get that proper chord and you'd be right on your way without any problems whatsoever. And that's what that shop was fantastic for for us. So yeah, it was... It was special, and it, it got sad over the years. You started to see it go downhill, right? Oh, yeah. It it started to show its age, and it's like, oh, this is painful. You can't even – at some point, you started going in and realizing you couldn't get the stuff you used to be able to get there and stuff anymore, and it, it, it kind of felt bad. I'm just, well, part of the problem was they started trying to become a dang uh, cellular uh, store. Exactly. Um, yeah. and, and they really lost sight of – of what it was that made them great to begin with. Mm. So um, this is actually from an article that I came across. It said, many feared that was the end of a popular source of electronic products and parts back when they filed for bankruptcy. However, Radio Shack is alive and well as a new company. It mm. did not come out of bankruptcy, as is the usual case. Instead, Standard General, which is a New York hedge fund, bought the assets and brand and formed a new company under the ownership of General Wireless with the name Radio Shack. It retained about 1,700 of the original 4,000-plus stores. Think about that now. It was over 4,000 stores when it went under. Roughly 1,400 of the 1,700 are co-branded with Sprint, and the telecommunications giant will sell cell phones and subscriber plans on site. Uh, it's now greatly scaled down. It's more focused on building a new business model around its stores and a greatly expanded online presence, which is something that they never really could figure out, it seems, in the latter latter years, you know, 06, 07, 08, and yep. on up until they filed for bankruptcy. Uh, it's going to continue to sell popular consumer electronics items, but it's also going to take advantage of the growing DIY, DIY and maker niche. Which we've always said they should have done. Yep. This is this is exactly the niche that they needed to get into. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I would not be surprised if you go to one of these Radio Shack stores and find some uh, 3D printers there. Yeah, or things like that. Yeah, um, it's also they're also going to pursue uh, the educational approach to the hobbyist market. They're going to participate in the STEM or science, technology, engineering, math movement in schools to introduce students to these technical fields, and it's also going to offer in-store learning sessions and demos. Nice. Now, one thing I decided I wanted to do, I wanted to look kind of at the history of Radio Shack. <clears throat> so, it has been known as uh, Radio Shack Corporation and as Tandy Corporation. It, ah. <laughs> it was founded in 1921 as Radio Shack by brothers Theodore and Milton Deutschman in Boston, Massachusetts. Hmm. It had its peak in 1999, and it operated stores. Those 4,000-plus stores were located in the U.S., Mexico, United Kingdom, Australia, and Canada. Hmm. When it filed for Chapter 11 in February, General Wireless came in on March 31st and bought it up for $160 million. 
hundred and sixty million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Radio Shack issued its first catalog in nineteen thirty nine. That catalog was something now. Hmm. I remember and uh <clears throat> you've probably experienced this. And sometimes it would actually aggravate customers and I understood why. <laughs> but you'd be checking out and we'd want your, you know, if I'm checking you out, you know, thank you. Can I have your address, please? For the catalog, yeah. <laughs> why, why do you need my address? Well, we want to make sure you're on our mailing list. I already get your catalog. Well, I need it again. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, that was the thing. And I would have customers, you're not getting my address. Mm. So I'd have to put the button in just miscellaneous and, and ring it up that way. Mm. It began selling its own private label uh, products in 1954. And uh, it was, apparently, this is not the first time Radio Shack's been been flirting with bankruptcy. It was basically bankrupt in the 1960s when it was purchased by Charles D. Tandy for $300,000. Now, a little side note, he purchased it for $300,000. They were selling about $14 million worth of AM and FM radios and other electronics, but they were spending more than they were making. Mm. So they had sales of $14 million a year, but yet he was able to buy the company for $300,000. That tells you how in, in dire straits they were even in the 60s. Yeah. And get this, Tandy was a leather goods company. Had nothing to do with electronics. Yep. So from the 1960s into the uh, early 1990s, Radio Shack promoted a Battery of the Month Club, which was a free wallet-sized cardboard card that offered one free inner sale a month in-store. And like the free tube testing offered in-store in the early 1970s, this small loss leader drew foot traffic, which you would expect. The cards also served as generic business cards for the salespeople. Made a lot Mm -hmm. of sense. They released the TRS-80 in 1977, which was two years after the MITS Altair 8800 was introduced. The TRS-80 had the benefit that it was a pre-assembled system at a time when all the other computers were put-together systems. Basically, you bought them as kits, and the end user had to put them together themselves. Yeah. It cost $600 in 1977. You can imagine. I'm not going to... Okay, I'm curious now. (laughs) <laughs> what is nineteen seventy six hundred dollars in today's money? Let's see if it'll give me that. Calculate the value. <laughs> wow. What is it? Three thousand seven hundred and sixty four dollars and thirty two cent. Wow, I think I think <sighs> That's, I think even the high-end gaming computers are less than that now, aren't they? <laughs> they are. They are. You, you're doing. You're doing good if you spend about twenty-five hundred dollars. I mean, you can spend thirty-five hundred if you want to. You know, right? If you're rich and stupid, but <laughs> yeah. But yeah, six hundred dollar machine equivalent to over three thousand dollars now. Mm. <sighs> So in 1980, then they came out with their TRS-80 color computer, which actually attached to a TV. And then um, it wasn't but a couple of years after that, the Commodore 64 came in and basically just kicked the crap out of everybody that was trying to get in that market. Yeah. Mid-1980s, Radio Shack began a transition from its proprietary 8-bit computers to its proprietary IBM PC-compatible Tandy computers, removing the Radio Shack name from the product. And that was in an attempt to shake off the long-running nicknames of Radio Scrap and Trash 80. Wow. <laughs> and it was to make the product appeal to business users. Poor compatibility, shrinking margins, a lack of uh, economies of scale led them to exit the computer manufacturing market in the 90s after losing much of the desktop PC market to people like Dale, and yeah. Gateway, places like that. Now, one thing I did not know is that Tandy actually acquired the Computer City chain in 1991 and then sold the stores to CompUSA in 1998. Interesting. Which which Tandy is a name around here, not just because of Radio Shack, but um, the first computer that was ever in our household was a Tandy 1000 TL. So, 
the first Tandy is not the first computer I ever had, <clears throat> but the first Tandy computer I had was a Tandy 1000 TX, mm. which was at the time they had the SX and the TX look the same as far as the case. My friend Troy had the SX, and it had an 8086 processor in it. The TX had an 8286. It was an upgraded model. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a hybrid because it was like a 286 chip, but on an 8088, 8086 motherboard. Ah, okay. So, yeah, mine ran like two and a half times faster than his. <laughs> and it was about $3,200 when my folks bought it because I got it. I got the monitor. I got the printer. I upgraded the modem. I mean, it came standard with a 300 baud, upgraded it to 1200 baud. I mean, I walked into the computer store, the Tandy computer store in Macon, Georgia, with a list. And the sales guy looked at me and goes, you've done your research. You know exactly what you want. I'm like, <laughs> I do. And I was 16 mm. at the time. So, yeah. Uh, 1982, the breakup of the Bell system encouraged subscribers to own their own telephone extensions, uh, i.e. their own phones. See, that's something that we don't even think about today. In the mm -hmm. early day, and I say the early days, 60s and 70s, all the way up until the baby Bells were broken up in the early 80s, you, you didn't buy a phone. You didn't go to Walmart, whether it was really, there, Walmart was around, but not like it is today. But you mm -hmm. didn't go to a department store and buy a telephone. You paid a monthly fee to rent that thing from your local telephone company. I had no idea until yes. you just told me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> telephone companies made a killing. I can off imagine. Of that. What do you yeah. think cable companies got the idea from? <laughs> <laughs> you have a point. Yeah, I didn't think of that. <laughs> oh. So when they broke them up, Radio Shack had 20 models of home phones to offer. So they were like the place to go and get telephones. Mm. 1994, the slogan America's Technology Store was abandoned for the, and I was there when this happened. You've got questions? We've got We've answers. Got answers. <laughs> I remember when that, when all of the stuff started coming in, we had to start changing all of our signage and everything. And I'm like, and I remember standing there looking at it going, that is the dumbest damn <laughs> slogan I have ever seen. But it worked, right? I well, guess. I mean, you got a, <laughs> you got a question? I might have an answer. That was kind of my attitude. <laughs> <laughs> like this is put this is put more of an onus on me to know what I'm talking about. I don't like this slogan at all. <laughs> no. Yeah, you've got questions. We've got answers. They may not be the correct answers, but we've got answers. <laughs> then in 1995, they launched a new logo. Uh, Radio Shack was spelled in camel case as Radio Shack, like all one word. Yeah, much together. Yeah, and then I remember they came out with the R, with the circle around it, and the R was kind of shifted to the side. And Yeah. Yeah, I was there for all that. They, uh, they dropped the Tandy name and became Radio Shack Corporation in 2000. <clears throat> in 2009, they... I remember this one. <laughs> they rebranded it themselves as The Shack... And they were trying to focus on increasing the sales of their mobile products. But unfortunately, they increased the sales of their mobile products, but it had a negative effect on their core components business. Mm. <laughs> and of course, when was it? It was last year or year before they had that whole campaign where it was like the, the 80s or the 80s. Wants their store back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. That was a terrible, terrible marketing. Ploy. I love I loved them. I mean they were funny. They were funny. Sort of. But they on sucked. The, <laughs> yeah, on on the level of internet, it was like they they decided to go to they decided to lean too much into internet culture with those to where they didn't quite hit the mark. But yeah. They were still hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Couple of pop culture references. Um <clears throat> a radio shock store owned by the Dandy Corporation. <laughs> appeared in the original 1991 release of Space Quest IV. It was displaced by uh, Haas or HZ So Good in later editions due to threats of legal action by Tandy. <laughs> I would have just let, if I owned the company, it's, it's not going to screw me over. And I would have just let them keep it in. Yeah. Come on. If nothing, it, I mean, there's no such thing as ne negative publicity mm. when it comes to something like that. I mean, 
yeah, people may laugh at it, but then they're like, hey, wait a minute, I need batteries. Let's go to mm-hmm. Radio Shack. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to the Radio Shock. Yep. Uh, Radio Shack was also featured prominently in Short Circuit 2, which served as a clinic for Johnny Five Alive. Uh, <laughs> he repaired himself after being assaulted by thieves. Yeah. I actually, I, I, I probably knew that at the time, but I don't even remember that. I mean, I remember the Johnny Five movies, but I don't remember that one specifically. I know the pop culture reference. I have never actually watched them. Yeah. They're, they were funny. They were funny movies, but... So it looks like, you know, it's uh, they're breathing new life into the franchise. It's it's not going to be the same, but it could be, it could be even better. With I what think I remember a podcaster. It, it might have been Jeff Kanata and Anthony Carboni over at We Have Concerns. Or one of them was talking about they went into a Radio Shack recently, and they wanted to get a part. They wanted to see if they could, right? And they said there was this little uh, shelving unit sort of thing that you could pull out. It's like in hardware stores, how they have all of the screws and stuff in the different little oh, plastic shelves. I know exactly things. what you're talking about. Tyler and I walked into the one here a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Same scenario. You want to find something, you just have to start pulling drawers out and trying to find it. And not to interrupt your story, but quickly... We actually asked the the sales associate, and he just looked at us dumbfounded like he had no <laughs> clue what it was we were asking for. Most likely, yeah. It was it was absolutely crazy. And that was the thing. They did not—and this was a company store. Yeah. That was the one thing that I discovered, having been in this environment, was that I would prefer a franchise store over a company store because the franchise store had a vested interest— as a, as you know, th- they were invested in it. This was their store. It was their money. Right. Yeah. They needed to know. Plus, a franchise also had the advantage, like we did. We did. We had access to everything that was Radio Shack, but we could also go outside of Radio Shack and buy other products and other components and things like that. We we could do a lot of other things that a Radio Shack corporate store would never even dream of trying to do. Mm. And so it yeah. was definitely a benefit to being a Radio Shack dealer. Yeah, ours was a franchise too. So we we had knowledgeable people. Every now and then dad would go over their head, but he's just he's just got the ability to do that. Yeah. He can, <laughs> I'm pretty sure if he talked to someone that was an expert in physics, he'd still be able to <laughs> mo- blow their mind out of their skull about something. Uh, he's just got that ability. Uh, but yeah, because it was a franchise, they were a bit more knowledgeable about things. So it was definitely, that was an advantage. Yeah, we had, there was a Radio Shack franchise in Fitzgerald. <clears throat> then there was a Radio Shack franchise in Douglas, which was roughly about 35 miles away. 35 miles away in Tifton, it was a company store. Mm. So, and I would very rarely, even before I worked for Radio Shack or Colony Telephone, I would very rarely ever go into the the company stores. We would always mm. go to the local one. Yeah. And the owner of the of the local one, uh, which you know turned out to be basically a really good friend of mine and almost like a father figure while I worked there, um, <clears throat> he he was a, a retired AT and T microwave tower maintainer. Oh, nice! Matter of fact, the the blinking lights, the I, I think the timing mechanism or something like that. I forget exactly what it is that controls the blinking lights on the towers for like to make sure that planes don't hit them. Mm. He invented. Oh. He had a patent on some part of that circuitry. I saw the original designs where he he made them up and actually, you know, baked the stuff in his oven. He still had the original designs down in his basement. Nice. So he he eventually let the patent lapse, which, you know, I called him an idiot for that, but anyway. <laughs> But he was a smart guy, and, you know, like I said, Radio Shack was a really good thing for the community to have, and, uh, you know, a lot of the core components were way overpriced. Mm. I mean, I saw the pricing. When you could get 
a pack of resistors, you know, a pack of 50 resistors, they cost us 10 cent and we charged a dollar 95 for them. Mm. But that was the pricing structure. It wasn't us that set the pricing. That was corporate. Yeah. So, but I'm glad to see it come back. Um, you know, some people, some people think that there's no place for uh, electronic stores anymore as far as being able to go and pick up like resistors and capacitors and things like that. But there are places in the U.S. now that that type of, of uh, environment, that type of store is actually doing quite well. Mm, I mean, yeah. you can buy stuff from DigiKey and other places online, but if you're in a pretty decent sized town that's got one of these places and you can just run on over there and get whatever component it is that day, you don't have to wait a day or two for it to come in the mail. Yeah. So I'm kind of happy to see them make a comeback. I'm not so jazzed about it being partnershiped with Sprint, but, <laughs> yeah, you know, it is what it is, I guess. All right. Anything you want to add on that? No, I'm good. All right. Well, I guess we're going to uh, make our way to the exit. Uh, so, Sam. Plug your stuff, man. What are you? Where are you at? What are you doing when you're not here talking tech on this particular podcast or our other podcast, Wide Open Talk Show, during the week? Of course. If you want to find all my podcasts and other content, you can go to tscn.tv. And if you want to help support that, you can go to tscn.tv slash support. If you want to find all my social media links, you can go to about.me slash labtech7 and find all the ways to get a hold of me. And that's it. <laughs> All right, good deal. All my stuff is over at slant.fm, this podcast, the Watch Podcast, a couple of other things that, that I'm I'm doing over there. All my social media stuff is at about.me slash GD If you got any feedback for this uh, particular episode or any episode of Tech Slant, that email address is feedback at slant.fm. If you want to leave a voicemail, the number is 313-718-2557, and uh, just state the name of the show that you want to leave the voicemail for. In this case, it'd be Tech Slant. We record this show every other Friday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, so come join us for our next episode, which will be on... I didn't update that. Uh, June 10th. Yes, yep. June 10th. All right. So we'll see you then, everybody. Take care. is a production of the Slant FM Digital Network. Find more at slant.fm.